Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And you're listening to episode 90. And this episode, we wanted to talk a little bit about digital ownership of games, DRM, and the notion of who really owns what you're playing. Yeah, it's an interesting thing that we've talked around before, Um uh, digital restriction management is something that w- at first only affected PC gaming when it first became part of the gaming vernacular. Um, but Jeff and I in previous episodes have talked about our immense Steam library and digital versus physical. And this is another feather either for or against digital ownership because essentially what DRM is, is this it's what allows you to own something digitally on your platform. If those rights get revoked, you no longer own that thing. Um, I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but it's this idea that with a lot of digital media, with our music, with our video games, with our movies, we don't buy physical things anymore. If it's on a platform that that platform decides, well, we don't want you to have it anymore, or more often than not, the people making the thing lose the rights to that thing, that info gets pulled. The first time I remember interacting with it uh, on a personal level, besides with Steam games, which is what the big hullabaloo when a lot of it went online only for stuff, was with Rock Band. Rock Band from game to game would allow you to upload your previous game's library. So the games from one would upload to two, and then the games from one and two would upload to three, but certain songs would fall off and I never understood why. And it's because they lost the distribution rights to those songs because they would have had to pay for them again to have you own them again. And Rock Band is one of many games that runs into that in terms of music rights. Yeah. And this isn't just a, an issue for video games in a way. There's also a lot of movies and TV shows, TV shows in particular, that can run into rights issues regarding music if you are working with a lot of different artists. Uh, The one that leaps to mind for me is Daria from MTV. The the DVD releases, when they happened, uh, didn't have a lot of the, you know, it was an MTV show. So you would use a lot of of the time music back and, you know, for scene transitions and everything. But, you know, when the DVDs happened 10 years later or whenever they were coming out, the Daria DVDs, they had to use like generic sounding guitar rock to do it. <laughs> and if that's all you know of it, OK, yeah, fine. But maybe that also then goes, but why was this such a big deal? You know, why is Rock Band such a big deal if, you know, oh, well, they there's a generic sound of like going on. Well, that's not as cool well yeah but when you've got to deal with so many different heads on this it's it's an issue well yeah and it's actually i ran into that issue with a tv show even more recently um with scrubs when it moved to hulu for for streaming the streaming rights didn't capture some of the music rights and so while on the dvds the all of that stuff is intact if you watch it on hulu some songs have been substituted for what the iconic choices were made by Bill Lawrence and some of the other creative staff. And it's really jarring, especially if you know the episodes really well, because uh, anyone who's a fan of Scrubs knows that that cast, especially Zach Braff and Bill Lawrence, put a lot of indie music in there that eventually became famous shortly after from bands like The Fray and a bunch of others. And so to see those songs missing in those scenes is is very jarring. And when it comes to, to games and DRM, a lot of the the concern from people is, well, what if this game company decides I can't own this thing anymore? And I mean, now that everything's connected to the internet, I feel like it's an even bigger deal. It was something that at first with Steam games and then later on other online stores, it was a bigger problem. But now that every console is online, every console has a digital library, you know, if from console to console or just over a period of time, certain things fall through the cracks you could lose like the biggest deal that i remember was for a long time the ducktales remastered game after it came out which i bought immediately after a while uh, capcom lost the rights to it i think it was when the new ducktales was in development there were some complications with disney and the rights i don't know the whole story but that, that sounds like that makes sense but it was around that time and 
they said, look, if you have it in your library and you have it downloaded, you have it, you can play it. But if you uninstall it, it goes bye bye. Eventually, I think they got the rights back because I think now it's back on the, the, the shop again. I, I think you can get it now. I think it is. Yeah. But, you know, that was a big concern for people who are like, well, I bought this game, though. I spent the money on it. Why? Why would you take it from me? You know, what if my computer dies? What if my motherboard explodes? Then I can't I can't get this game back. You know, and it's a big concern for folks who have large digital libraries. Like what happens if a company just decides you can't have this anymore? Yeah. And you then almost have a feeling of, do I have to now go through my digital library once a week and be like, well, let's make sure they're all still here. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. It's, yeah. It's like a, it's like a farmer waking up and checking the grain silo. I don't know. But and to be fair, like PC games and DRM has um, DRM has several sound principles in its conception and its ideas. It is sort of the modern evolution of copy protection. Yes. Which, again, a much bigger thing for PC games than console games for a very long time. That was one of the reasons why games were on cartridges in addition to just distribution and whatever it also meant most people didn't have cartridge flashers or spare carts or anything like that if you did you were pretty dedicated it's almost like well done but the nes had uh the had copy protection in the chips that they used but in pc gaming they had a lot of different ways of doing it because it's easy to send files it's easy to if it, the game is small enough, copy it onto a floppy disk. Like, look up shareware if you really want to look at the weird points where, okay, this is how we get the game out, but if everybody copies it, then we're not going to get any money for the game. And some of the copy protection that PC games used to have were wild. That would require you to have the instruction manual so that you could type in words or answer questions based on specific pages. There were all kinds of ridiculous things. And that also seeped into console games. Uh, Star Tropics for the NES rather infamously has a puzzle that is solved by a letter that is packed in with the game that you have to dip in water to find the secret code. Granted, it's a three-digit code, and it's the same code across games, and now with the internet, we're okay. <laughs> and in the digital re-releases of the game, like the virtual console, they had to figure out a digital solution for you to dip the letter and get this code, which I think is like 757. Ah, I've ruined everything. But <laughs> it's something like that. But And so it, it makes sense. In, in, a, in an idea of... If you get a digital game, you have the complete file, the complete game. What's to stop me from just sending this to all my friends and giving it to everybody? Uh, DRM is is one of those ways to go about it. And uh, and a further arguing for DRM, and I I I have complicated feelings about DRM and digital games in general, which um I have spoken of before and will speak on today. But an argument for it is the fact that. Even physical games do degrade. Yeah. It's not necessarily a matter of what if the company suddenly decides I can't own the game anymore? What if, you know, my older brother breaks my game because, uh, you know, I made him mad? What if, uh, w what if I break my brother's game because <laughs> I'm really mad? Um, <laughs> these didn't happen exactly, but uh -huh. it's, sure. it's sort of. Kirby's Adventure is never the same, and I feel awful about it. <laughs> but I'm so sorry, Chris. But anyway, or, or just the fact that disc rot happens yeah. and physical copies degrade over time. But for me, that is a bigger argument towards there needs to be a better coming together of digital and physical. But the concept of a company, yeah, digital storefronts go away. And not even just the... A singular game being like, well, we don't have the rights to that anymore, or we can't make that happen. Try to get Castlevania The Adventure Rebirth for the Wii. You can't. It doesn't exist The Wii anymore. Shop doesn't exist anymore, and that game has no other release. Yep. SOL. Yeah, it's, it's weird how 
DRM can be considered this double-edged sword. I mean, for me, like as someone who has had multiple PCs since I got Steam and started downloading my thousands and thousands of games on Steam that I only play a fraction of, um, I, I, like if I didn't have DRM, if I didn't have this way to have these this ownership over these games so I could just re-download them on a new console, it'd be a big problem. And I also think what's interesting about having digital versions of games and what I was always curious about is like back in the heyday of Blu-ray when Blu-ray still came with DVDs they also always came with a digital copy now I haven't bought a physical release of a Blu-ray in a long time so I don't know if they still do but when I remember getting the Scott my copy of Scott Pilgrim at the time I didn't have a Blu-ray player so I went in on it with a friend of mine my friend Neil and he bought the Blu-ray. I gave him some money for the DVD and the digital version. He kept the Blu-ray version. And so I could watch it on my DVD player at home and still have it for my iPod. Um, back when iPods played videos, um, when you didn't have an, when everyone didn't have iPhones. Yeah. And like, you know, I thought that was super cool. The fact that you could buy a thing and get both versions. And I was always curious why video games never did that. Like, it seems to make sense to me that if you bought a physical copy, but you wanted to play it digitally as well, maybe on a different platform, why not include that? I mean, I guess they, you know, the end of the end of the day, it's dollars. They want your money. But like, if I bought Bloodstained on the Switch, and it's not really running well on the Switch, why not give me the PC version for free, which is the same cost, and let me play it on my PC? Like, I, it's not like one is valued higher than the other. They were both 60 bucks plus tax. And I just don't know why the games industry doesn't do that other than they want to make you pay for it per platform. And I feel like as we move towards all digital consoles, which the next gen is teasing, there might be less of that. It's possible. It and I think some of that might have to do with rights or distribution of profit. Yeah. You know, buying a game on the Switch versus buying it for the PC, who gets what amount or whatever. That's true. As well. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why I enjoyed buying into the Sony ecosystem is the amount of cross play mm -hmm. that went on there. You know, you can buy a digital game for a regular, whatever the regular price or the sale price, depending on when you got it. And a lot of them would be compatible. That purchase meant you could play it on whichever platform could do it. If that meant PS3 and PS4, if that meant PS3 and Vita, if it meant 3, 4, Vita, whatever it was, like, that's definitely tempted me with, like, well... Maybe maybe I want that. Maybe I, maybe I should get that. Yeah. And and to be fair, that also for me for that same argument of like you know when the shop goes down or when a platform is no longer supported, knowing that you know I bought this PS3 game that I can still play on the PS4, that is that has value. That has a, a sense of safety to it. Uh, granted, the Sony shop has maintain support of all of the games that they have released digitally for the most part, at least all the platforms. I do know some games come and go, but I'm, I'm not sure how well in the, in the all digital generation, whether that is this coming one, the one after, but you're right. It's, it's most likely coming. And it, you know, uh, physical games feel like they're going the way of vinyl records still around, still thriving, but more of a collector, more of a niche thing. I don't know how we're going to navigate, uh, you know, the the software key going across platforms. It, it, I don't know that there's a hard answer for it. I think that also part of the problem is games from older platforms that then get re-released or remastered later, you know, like there's a big, a lot of the big conversation right now is about uh, PS4 to PS5 up conversion and that a lot of games are including that for free. But um, Remedy, who made one of my all-time favorite games of recent history, Control, got into some hot water recently when they announced that um, they are releasing a up version for the PS5 with better graphics, better lighting, all the fun stuff, but you'll have to buy it full price with all the DLC. And I think it's it's gonna come with all the DLC, but it's full a full price game on the new console. Um, and that if you want those up res, and that the old one will be backwards compatible on the PS5, 
but you won't get the up res. It'll be the old version. And there's no free up res if you own the old version. Whereas a lot of other games, I believe GTA and a bunch of others, are if you own the old version, you'll be able to download the up res bit. And so that is an extension of this like digital new life cycle that is even not necessarily related to just DRM, but just in general, d digital life and these games that are coming out towards the end of one life cycle into the next. In previous generations, it hasn't been as big of a deal because the graphical difference was so humongous. But I think now that the graphical leaps are smaller, not insignificant, but smaller, they can make those kind of minor adjustments as a patch or whatever. And so for a company to charge you to make you buy the game again on a new platform, is causing some outrage but also i don't understand why i mean why do gamers get outraged i mean they get outraged over everything at this point so, everything yeah but like for me i recently rebought uh castle crashers the remastered version on switch um and i love i love that game it's one of my favorite games it's just such a fun well-made game i had it on the 360 and i got rid of my 360 when i was dumping collections because i just didn't have the space for them the 360 i was never playing so i let it go and so I was happy to repurchase it because it was a remastered version. It had more stuff in it um, and it was on a new platform, a portable platform. But that said, if I had had it already and like 360 was like, well, we're partnered with Nintendo. We're doing all these great things together. You can also freely up master up res if you owned it here. Like if they had offered something like that, I probably would have taken it. And so I kind of fall in the middle. Like I, I'm sure you like I have repurchased games on new platforms because you don't have the old version for whatever reason or because the new version has something new and shiny on it. I am a Wii U owner. Yes. <laughs> and so like. While it's easy to get mad about having to repurchase stuff, I think also part of it is if you didn't have it before or you wouldn't have access to it before, then do you really mind repurchasing it? I mean, a big part of this conversation comes up because as of when we're recording, although this will be released many months later, so we're dating ourselves a little bit, green content um, is uh, as of when we're recording, they announced that the Scott Pilgrim game, Ubisoft, uh, is bringing the Scott Pilgrim game back. It came out last gen. It was very popular. It came out right around the time of the movie. It's a great beat em up, incredible music by Anna Managuchi. And it disappeared because uh, I believe Universal pulled the rights from Ubisoft. They were just like, you yes. don't have the rights to this anymore, which is something big companies do. And so Ubisoft was like, I guess we have to take this game off the market now. And they removed it from their digital shops in a similar way to what I was talking about with DuckTales, where you if you had it still it didn't it wouldn't disappear um but but if you didn't have it it's gone um and so they're re-releasing it on modern consoles it's coming out on the switch ps4 and and xbox one and it's really exciting for me because i love that game and i got rid of my 360 and i didn't know if i'd ever get to play it again um but that said had i owned it on i don't think it was available on pc before but it might be coming to pc now I think that's the case. Yeah, I think it was just Xbox and PS3. Yeah. And so um, that's exciting. But like for the people who already own it on the 360, like they don't care. They're like, well, I have this game already. Who cares that they're bringing it back? If they still have their 360 plugged in. Right. And so I don't know. I think it's exciting when games get to do a comeback like this, especially when they disappear. But, you know, if there was a physical copy on the Xbox 360 of the Scott Pilgrim game, then it wouldn't matter. And this is all comes back to the persist persistent internet connection thing, which even though lots of people have internet, not, not everybody does. It's still a gating on video games to require persistent internet connection. And there are a ton of Steam games that I think you can play offline, even if they have online features, but not all of them. And I know no Blizzard game works offline. All of them require an internet connection. If you're not on the internet, you cannot play any of Blizzard's games. Yeah, and I find that very frustrating. And no, I, I, I agree. The persistent internet uh, ecosystem is frustrating. And I had a, a, a and when, you know, the, the rights are no longer good and the game gets pulled, you know, you don't get your punch out versus Mike Tyson's punch out <laughs> kind of situation. Right. And, right. And, and I had a different experience with the Scott Pilgrim game because... That was during a time when I was always at least a generation behind as far as playing games. So I didn't have a PS3 or an Xbox 360 when Scott Pilgrim came out. So I might have played the game once or twice on someone else's system, but I didn't really play it. 
And then it got pulled. And I was like, well, this looks like an this this looks like an amazing game. Would have been great. And a, a little while ago, I uh, bought one of my friends uh, a much of his you his old video game collection, like all of his previous gen and older. And that included his PS3, where he had Scott Pilgrim. But I also have a PS3 login and everything had to switch over and whatever else. And so by the time I'd switched it over, like I then checked the games that were downloaded. Oh, I was no. like, oh, yeah. So I got to play the demo of Scott Pilgrim, the video <laughs> game. Oh, no. And that was a lot of fun. It was great. <laughs> I'm so excited this game is coming out again. But in addition to, you know, a couple of Sega Saturn games that I can pop in and play his Sega Genesis titles, some PS one stuff, like all of these that are like, cool. Thank you so much. These are going to a good home, getting to play them, enjoy them and and everything else. Any of the digital titles are now gone into the ether. There is no game sharing in that way. Yeah. And it's, and as somebody who, loves having physical games not just as a collector as a, a strange you know pseudo dragon that this is my hoard i also love having physical games to lend them to people yeah and to to be completely unable whether it's here take my console for the weekend and try out this game or not being able to like you know here's the game card um like in 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 lockdown pandemic times, I was able to lend out a couple of uh, switch titles to a friend so that his 10 year olds could uh, play uh, let's go Eevee and Shantae. Yeah. And you know, I didn't have access to them for the past couple of months, but they're back in town and you know what? I played those games. I loved them and I'm happy someone else gets a chance to play them and enjoy them as well. So, uh, you know, if DRM, can figure out a way to be able to be like, all right, I'm denying my access so that someone else can for a period of time. But that is also getting into a whole bunch of hacking issues, of course. But again, you buy the games, you own the games, then you forget your password. <laughs> there, there's, there's so many pitfalls. There is no perfect solution. No. And like, I'm, I'm, and I hear what you're saying, and I, I feel similarly when it comes to that. Like, the only reason I, I, I credit you 100% for why I'm a Shovel Knight fan, because I told you I had never played it. You're like, oh, well, I have it on the, um, the what it wasn't the Switch. It was the 3DS. It was the 3DS. And you're like, here, borrow it. And I borrowed it. I played it for hours and hours and went, I, I need this. Uh, here, Jeff, have it back. I'm buying it on my Switch. And I bought the Treasure Trove and I'm and I love it. It's become one of my favorite games. And I couldn't I couldn't have had that experience if you couldn't lend it to me. And I completely agree that I wish DRM had some kind of like, and so Steam sort of has something like that. If you set up a Steam family plan and you mm-hmm. add um, people to it, they can play your games when you're not playing them. So like Sarah has a Mac, so she can't play a lot of my Steam games, but like games like A Short Hike and a few others that are really great, small indie titles work really well on her Mac. And so we set up a family plan so we could share games back and forth. And like for a while I had that set up with my friend Mike and my friend Brian also where like, We had access to each other's libraries. When Steam did its most recent update, it booted a lot of people out because what you have to do is to activate a family plan, you have to add someone to it and then they, then you have to log in on their computer with your credentials. So both computers give the okay. And so um, when I was doing a LAN party with a friend, my friend Mike ages ago, we did that and we both had access to each other's libraries and like, our libraries are so big that the odds of us both playing the same game at the same time was so small uh, that it really worked. And like the only place it was a problem is like for online multiplayer games like your Borderlands and other co-op games, you couldn't play them together off of one copy. And that makes and that makes sense that 
now that a lot of games try to be online multiplayer all the time, yeah, you'd run into that. Right. And but it, it was a version of lending that allowed you to play other games that you might not have had an experience with. It's how I played Final Fantasy VI for the first time. Yes, I played the PC version. Yes, I know it's not as good. Yes, I know sprite smoothing is terrible. I've complained about it on this podcast. But that said, fair enough. I might have never gotten to play six if it weren't for that. And I loved it until I got to one of the bosses on the floating rocks and then kept dying. I think that was... Um, Atma weapon. Yeah, yep. Just killed me over and over again. But anyway, um, I would have never had exposure to that game without that kind of lending system. And I wish that more games or companies offered that. Like, I would love to lend you, Jeff, a digital copy of one of my games. And like, if while you're playing it or while I've lent it out, I'm restricted, I can't access it. So it's like grayed out. I'd be fine with that. I have so many games on my Switch, which again, I've often said is starting to look like my Steam library that I would love for my friends to play. And if I could like lock my access so they could play it, I would totally do that with a ton of different games. Yeah, whether that is to a close friends list or there is some access given there, that that is a great thing that could happen. But I, I, I don't know if that will ever happen and if it does when it could happen yeah I've, I've definitely done the like log into my steam library on another computer so i could try you know so i could share this game and when i log out like okay they can't play it anymore cool get that like there's points where this where drm in the current landscape succeeds yeah it's not as if it is a complete and utter failure there's just a lot of weak spots and a lot of difficulty and as as i said earlier i am all for digital preservation of games so that we don't lose them and so that in the next 5 10 20 50 years as uh whatever media that it comes on degrades that various i mean there, there's various foundations that are like trying to save everything and it would be truly remarkable if some of this could be utilized for digital preservation as well you know preserving your purchase yeah because yeah we, we talk about the notion of like uh, where we we buy experiences you you pay for the, the access to it rather than the physical thing and that just gets um dangerous and dark after a while when you really think about it so yeah for sure for sure and i think also like this isn't just a conversation about drm but it's a conversation about preservation of games and what happens when those games disappear and like very recently also um nintendo for mario's 35th anniversary which made me realize that i'm older than mario which means either he's aged really poorly or i've aged really well either way i'll take it um they announced a, a Super Mario All-Stars pack for the first time in a long time, and it's a 3D All-Stars pack with Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine, and Super Mario Galaxy. And a lot of people were giving hate online, like, why are they charging $60 for these three games? They're old games, they should be cheaper. And meanwhile, me over here with none of his old original consoles, is so happy that I'm gonna have one cartridge with three of my, well, two of my favorite 3D Mario games and a Mario, a 3D Mario game that I need to give another shot. Um, and like I played Mario 64 so much and I was so excited when the 3DS or the DS version came out, but then I was less excited when I played it because they made a lot of strange changes. And it made for the game to be more interesting and more dynamic and I know why they did it, but like I love the classic experience. And so to be able to get those on the Switch in a few weeks from when we're recording is is really exciting and then they announced that they're a limited release. You'll have access to it forever if you buy it, but if you don't buy it before the end of March of 2021, it goes away doing the Disney yeah. vault thing with their games. And this is this is the other side of DRM and of digital access of restricting like if you buy a physical copy you've bought it, you have it. But I don't I I don't know if they're actually how many physical copies they're doing if any. I it was unclear from the announcement if It sounds like they're doing a physical release. Uh, they are, there okay. will be a, uh, but I don't know. You're right. I don't know how widespread. And so like to, but to limit the purchase after like the Disney vault is a thing now that doesn't really exist anymore now that we have disney plus like there are some movies i think that are still not on it for one reason or another but for the most part the disney vault is done because 
Like at least they had an end game. A streaming service for Disney makes sense to hold on to your movies and not and restrict access until you release this big platform that you want everyone to subscribe to. I get that. But for Nintendo to restrict the purchase of this game that's a hugely influential game that will sell really well and will sell constantly. I know it's to put pressure on people to buy it sooner and maybe they need the money as a company who the hell knows, but it just it it, it 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 irritates me but that said i'm still really excited about those games because i don't own physical copies of those games anymore especially mario sunshine a game that i hated when it came out because it wasn't what i wanted but after playing splatoon and a bunch of other games that that was definitely the forefather for i'm like oh maybe the game will be a lot more fun maybe i just was too hard on it and i'm excited to re-experience all of that stuff again yeah uh Game holds up. <laughs> uh, de- definitely. Uh, Sarah had that feeling, uh, I think, beginning of this year, late last year. I think uh, we watched a sp- like a GDQ speed run of Super Mario Sunshine. And she was like, you know, I, I don't think I ever gave this a fair shake. And so, yes, p- get hyped. It's going to be good. But, yeah, and when a lot of these re-releases happen... There is a certain frustration. I did say before, yes, I own a Wii U, so I know the strange feeling of like, oh man, I got a great deal on Hyrule Warriors. A week later, they announced that they're releasing it for the Switch with all of the stuff. God damn it, I gotta get that. (laughs) Um, I don't have to get it, but honestly, that one in particular was a good buy. I haven't bought the Switch version of Captain Toad just because I like my Wii U version, but when you go back further and further, Nintendo has usually been fairly good about at least its flagship titles or its flagship series doing periodic. Now you have access to, you know, Mario brothers, Mario, super Mario one, two, three, you have access to, you know, how many different ways can we play super Mario world? How many different ways can we play Ocarina of time? Right. It's usually pretty good about that. So I I agree. It's a little, I'm going to see how this whole limited release window plays out. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to get 3D All-Stars. I I have those games already. Yeah. This, This release is not for me. And that's the other thing. Like, not everything that comes out, you don't have to, just because you love a series doesn't mean you need every release of it. Nope. And everything is not for you. You're like, I, I never want to tell people they can't express their displeasure with something, but like, you don't have to attack people online for them being excited about a thing. Like I get not being excited about the also Mario 3D World, a game I didn't get to play because as we've talked about famously on this podcast, I'm playing all of my Wii U games on the Switch. I never had a Wii U. And so for, for Super Mario 3D World to get a release is super exciting because I heard it was one of the best mario games to come out in a long time it's really good yeah you're you're the guy that these releases are for yeah and i should be happy for you and (laughs) i am (laughs) but that said like you know i I get the frustration of if you own this stuff already like well where's the stuff for me and i understand that to a degree and i think when it comes to the digital release of a lot of these games and the re-releases of a lot of these games like for example i expressed a lot of frustration that castlevania symphony of the night got a re-release on playstation 4 but not switch which seemed like a no-brainer since it's a playstation game and the switch could easily handle it um but it's a rights issue sony and konami have this agreement about that specific game and it's only been released on xbox and playstation I don't even think it got a Steam release, to my knowledge. I don't think so. So, like, to restrict it, I guess, makes sense. I mean, Konami's also doing weird stuff left and right anyway. Um, Yeah. Too too, too many pachinko machines and not enough, you know, anything else. Yeah, no. (laughs) uh, I I had a realization recently that two of my favorite series are Konami series, and they are just pachinko machines now. Between Metal Gear and Castlevania, it's just... It's frustrating. Yeah. And and it's nice that some games are getting released. Like Castlevania Anniversary Collection. That was awesome, yeah. That's awesome. Like, oh my God, now I don't have to spend $80 on Bloodlines <laughs> and everything else. And again, like the, this is all a very muddy issue and access matters. Yeah. And I realized another area outside of video games where this kind of thing comes up or can be... Certainly not necessarily the DRM, but more on the, well, I bought it once. Why do I need to buy it more than once? 
is in Dungeons and Dragons right now. Mm. Fifth edition, uh, I love it. There is D and D Beyond, the online portal where you can that is fairly very robust actually in in features and in terms of when you have access to the material, what it can calculate and what it can set up and what it can do in its front end is not perfect, but by God, it's good. But you have to pay book price for access to the content. Oh, jeez. And there is no, and they do run sales. They do run sales, but still and all. And you can also buy things piecemeal. Like if you don't need to buy the entirety of all of these different adventures, but you want to utilize the magic items or the creatures or whatever it is, you can pay individually for those. But if you buy the book, like the physical book, that does absolutely fuck all for your D&D Beyond access. Now, look, the D&D Beyond front end, I understand. They need the money, too, in order to, like, get all of these things working, going, server costs, etc. But there is absolutely, to my knowledge, no crossover. There is no amount of buying one does anything for you on the other. No discount, no nothing. And maybe that's because of the fact that there is no, like, DRM for a book. Yeah. And if you register a book and then sell it or get rid of it and someone buys it, they can't register that book. But I don't know. I, I, I absolutely do not know. But it is, it's interesting to see that in the age of the Internet of Things and uh, the, the further digital marketplaces, those, I, I wonder where the digital-only costs come from and go on a console's end. That is a genuine question of mine. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, there's been lots of arguments that like, why are we paying $60 for a physical release that includes a box and a booklet? Well, not really booklets even anymore, just a box and a cartridge. Usually a link to download the booklet. Yeah, um, whereas the digital is the same cost and there's no cartridge or disc to make and no box. And I think the argument is mostly that physical media has been a loss for most game companies since the dawn of time, especially the making of consoles. No company makes their money on the consoles they sell. They make the money on the software and the digital software, they make even more money because they're not producing anything to sell that thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think that what I really love for DRM to allow is some kind of sharing program is like the key to making it you know, I get it. It's a rights thing. And back in the day, we had CD keys. And, you know, before Internet was as robust, we had other ways of protecting those purchases. But I think that it brings us into a conversation of copyright and ownership, which we've talked about a little bit before. Like, do you own the things you purchase that are created? And it, like it, this was a big conversation back in the Napster days with music. Like if you're downloading music with Napster, which for those who are not in the know, because we're ancient, uh, Napster was the earliest incarnation of like LimeWire and Morpheus and all of these other programs that allowed you to freely share programs, MP3s and all sorts of other stuff. You know, are you stealing if you're taking the music without paying for it? And I mean, the short answer is yes, but yes. the long answer is who does the, like, the, once the person has released the music, like where's the ownership? And, you know, a lot of artists have talked this way too. I know a lot of artists who give away their catalogs of music at a, a massive discount because they want people to follow the other stuff as they go, not necessarily the backlog on the library. But, you know, it's the same thing with interpretation. Like folks, like um, she who shall not be named because she's a transphobe, um, we don't consider her as Harry Potter fans to own that series anymore. You know, she wrote it, it's done, but now it's ours and we can still love that thing without loving her. But right. that said, if she, she keeps running her mouth about how now wizards like wand away their poop and stuff and it's like, you, let, let it go. Let these people have their thing. It's not yours anymore. But on the other end, she did create it. She does make the money from it. It did come from her brain. And so there's, I, I don't ever feel like I personally feel that you own the art you consume while someone else created it and it was theirs. Now that you have it, everything about it is yours because you are the one doing the interacting with it. Um, I agree. 
but I, you, I also have a lot of friends who are musicians and game designers and creators of all different stripe. And, you know, I don't want, I, I would be the last to say, well, you can't have any ownership or pride over it. Like, I mean, we, Jeff and I own this podcast as much as anyone can own a podcast, but like at the end of the day, we're not making it, we're making it for us, but we're also making it for us to have a conversation with y'all. And at the end of the day, your ownership of the conversation and wanting to interact is what gives it value, not our purely creating it. Agreed. And I mean, the, the Napster era music is an interesting one in terms of how much physical media music was being sold for at that point Yeah. versus how much of that made its way back to the artists. That's one that I can't off the top, off the top of my head speak intelligently upon. But I do remember the ratio being heavily against the uh, the original artist. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why they were putting it out. Like, they would put their catalog out there. It's like, well, I ain't, I ain't making much more on it. Yeah. And sometimes it was a good marketing tactic. I mean, Radiohead did a great thing within Rainbows. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does become an interesting question because when games were only physical, it's very easy to be like, I own this product, yeah. and this product contains one copy of Deadly Towers on the NES, <laughs> right? Um, for better or worse, <laughs> and and so this then becomes a matter of, well, that was the product. the The game release was the product contains game work. What is the product now? Is it permission? Is it a disc? And how far does that product go? It's easy to take a physical product, to take a, a book you own, a comic book, a, a vinyl record, a, a game cartridge, pack it in a box and take it with you wherever you're going. Put it in a backpack and bring it to a friend's house. When it is a digital, an intangible thing, well, what then is the product? And there's... There's a lot of arguments to be had there and a lot of things to be said, and I do not have a conclusive statement at the moment. Um, but that is where these things get muddy, and that is where these matters. Because when you buy a physical product, when you buy the, the singular product, as it were, you don't have as much of a question of copyrights coming in and taking this away from me. It doesn't become a recall because, you know... Uh, of, of who has the rights to Crash Bandicoot at the moment, thinking on Universal. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't have to send in things and be given a new copy based on current rights. But some games, you buy the physical product, and because of DLC, you don't have much of the game at all, and you have to download it. Then the rights get a little more muddy. You know, are you able to download the entirety of... Look, you know, Final Fantasy VII Remake comes with a big old install disc. And maybe all of the files are on there. Maybe you've got to download some new stuff. Maybe not. Maybe some, and I know some games are absolutely nothing but the um, first level and download the rest of the game. Well, now, what is the product? Is it the install file or is it this really stupidly overpriced disc that I own now? I don't know. Yeah, it, it. I think I think what's going to be really telling, I mean, because, you know, PCs have been mostly digital games for a long time. I haven't bought a physical disc for a PC game in a very long time, but consoles are still battling with that. And, you know, with the announcement of the new Xbox, you know, the, the $299 cost being for just the digital version, and there will be a version that plays physical disc as well, but they're focusing on that version because... Xbox has been pushing with Game Pass on PC and a bunch of other things to go fully digital. And Microsoft, you know, da you know, being the purveyors of Windows, has been in that market for so long, they see where that's going. Whereas Nintendo and Sony still push for the physical stuff and wanting discs, but they also, you know, they, you know, the Switch Lite arguably could be considered the all digital system. It doesn't connect to a TV. You know, it has a cartridge slot, but you know, it, I, I feel like, and then, you know, the PS5 is going to have an all digital version as well. I'm curious. I think the, the real questions about DRM and ownership and the life cycle of digital gaming is going to be challenged with this next generation of consoles. 
Because again, this is this is not a fight to be had on PC already. It's done. Your games are DRM. You're if you're buying them on Steam, Epic, or Origin, or any other platform I've forgotten that barely gets used, it's you have a digital version. That's it. You don't get physical nothing. Yeah, and yeah, and it does become there. There is that little bit of fear of like, but what if they take it away? Well, they're probably not going to. Yes, but what if they do? Yep. And, and it's one thing when that happens. It's and it's one thing when a game is only compatible with Windows 95 and we are still figuring out strange wrappers and workarounds so that I can play the Neverhood on my Windows 10 uh, PC. And, oh my God, that's it's a nightmare. But <laughs> anyway, still figuring it out. But, and so there is still, like, the, the console updates, there is still system updates, but that's us. That's We choose to update and we got to deal with that. But yeah, wh- where does this digital landscape go, and where does it cross over with the physical, if it ever will again? Yeah, it's it's really hard to know. I'm curious for our listeners if you have a preference one way or the other. I mean, for me, when DRM became part of the video game conversation, I just kind of accepted it. A lot of people were outraged about it, and I get it. But I kind of just accepted it as well. I want to have these games if this is how I have to get them then so be it um, but I'm curious if it's affected your purchasing habits if there are some games that you have run into personally with uh, rights issues like I, me losing my access to Scott Pilgrim or like even PT famously the demo that was never to be some people still fight tooth and nail to hold on to that game because Konami and Sony doesn't want you to have it and like, where, where is the right of ownership there? Like, if you love this game and they made it for you and you want to keep it, who are they to take it from you? And so I'm curious if you listener have had any experience with that. Are you one of those people hoarding a PS3 somewhere that you never use with PT on it so it doesn't go away? Because these are questions we never thought we'd have to deal with in the age of you know, the NES and SNES. And now... It becomes more and more pervasive as more and more games disappear, fall off the radar, or you lose access to them entirely. Where does your initial cost go? Do you feel you own the game? Do you feel like you're just now being allowed for them to keep giving you the game over and over, but you pay once until you lose it or until they decide that they being whichever company and whichever platform decides that, uh, no, you don't get that anymore. It's... It's, it's a strange thing to wonder about. And have you lost games because of rights changing hands? Uh, do you have, yeah, do you, what old games do you have that no one can get anymore, but you, you need to sell the whole system in order to get it to somebody? Strange world we live in, but we're here and let's talk about it. And thank you so much for, for, for joining us for this and all of our previous and hopefully all of our future conversations. You can check us out on Fun and Games Pod on Twitter. You can email us at the same at Gmail. You can also find us at certainpov.com along with a lot of other fantastic podcasts of all kinds. Don't we don't we have some new ones, Matt? We do. Um, uh, uh, by the time this is out, it'll be old news. But Judging Book Covers has joined us, which is an incredible literature podcast. And you should definitely check it out. It's kind of like a book club. Um, they do some specials and some run of events. Um, and uh, they do some really great stuff. And so if you are a bookie, is bookie a word like gamer? I don't know. I made it up. It is now. now. It is. Um, you should definitely check that out. It's a phenomenal show. Um, Meg and Steph do some great work. And so you should definitely go check that out. We also have a discord server where you can come chat with us about our shows. Jeff posts a question of the day every day, except Sunday, um, talking about a question in gaming that we can chat about the things we love. Um, also, if you have the time, a like, a rate, a review, a subscribe on your favorite podcast platform helps us big time, specifically Apple iTunes podcast app. Um, we want to grow this community, uh, engage in conversation and doing that for us really helps the podcast to get noticed. Um, so if you can take five minutes out of your day and just do that, that would be really appreciated. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you for any and all of that that you may do now or in the future. Thank you for being part of this conversation. I'm Jeff Moona. And I'm Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And happy gaming. Hey, Viewfinders. MJ and Matt here with a little announcement. N7 Day is fast approaching, and we want to do something fun. One of our Discord pals suggested we turn some fanfic into small radio plays. Thanks again, Meg. We're really excited about this idea. 
So, what we'd like from you, listeners, is a submission of your own fanfic that we can narrate with the help of our network colleagues. This is a great opportunity for us to shout out content creators in the fandom and celebrate the games we love. If you'd like to submit your work, head over to tinyurl.com slash n7day. That will take you to a Google form where you can file your submission. If we don't select your fic for the episode, don't worry. I plan on saving any submissions we don't use for future fandom corners. We'll be accepting your submissions until October 24th. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash n7day. If you have any trouble with the submission form, please email us at reignitepod at gmail.com. Good luck, viewfinders. We'll be back next week to talk about Grissom Academy with Josh Kostler. I'm MJ. And I'm Matt A.K. Stormageddon. We, we should, should go. go. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.